Hey, hi everyone, and welcome to another installment of our Long Range Colloquium um, hosted by Virtual Science Forum. So I just wanted to uh, take a minute uh, for um, any of you who are joining us for the first time to say a few words about um, Virtual Science Forum, which is a uh, volunteer run and collaborative initiative. Um, and our aim is to facilitate online scientific events. Um, and uh, we are very open to, um, to your uh, uh, joining us and helping us. If you would like to do so, I will post some links in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, all of our work is available on YouTube uh, where we post all the recordings. Um, and I would also like to thank institutional support from Kavli Institute of Nanoscience at Delft. I especially want to draw your attention to a new initiative that we have called Speaker's Corner. This is uh, basically a self-invited uh, event where you can organize your um, newest work and give a presentation. We'll take care of the um, uh, infrastructure and the uh, advertising and so on. Um, and I will post a link to that as well. So today we are um, very honored to have Jonathan um, Simon, who's gonna tell us uh, about um, his very interesting work with, uh, photons and interacting uh, photons. Uh, Jonathan is a, a professor at the University of Chicago. And without further ado, um, I'll, the floor is yours, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Uh, I will start my timer because there's nothing worse than going over. Um, so uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, I have to say, I really appreciate that we had a little bit of time to chat beforehand. It's uh, the, the best part of these kinds of interactions is always talking science with people. And it seems like, you know, that's, uh, that's where we've really paid through the pandemic. So uh, efforts to sort of maintain that, I, I, I really like and appreciate. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for putting this together. Um, what I'm gonna do today is tell you about ongoing work uh, in my group at the University of Chicago. Um, and uh, in collaboration with Dave Schuster's group, uh, making uh, small, you can call them materials if you want, you can call them molecules of light if you're more of a cynic, um, diatoms if you're really a cynic. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're flexible here on the terminology. Um, so uh, what I wanna do is sort of tell you about that and, and uh, use it to sort of get an idea of what it really means for something to be a material. So. Uh, we can start then with this question of uh, what do I mean when I say a material? Well, what I mean is a collection of particles that interact with one another and thereby sort of organize or order. So I've got a classical simulation here. Each of these blue dots is a massive particle that uh, attracts all of the other blue dots when they're far apart. And when it gets near another dot, it repels it. And I've got a little bit of friction. And with just those ingredients, these little blue dots organize into some kind of crystalline structure that has phonons, it's got order. Um, uh, you can see the crystallinity, everything uh, makes sense very nicely. We didn't have to impose the crystallinity, we got it sort of for free um, from these ingredients. What did we need? We need a collection of particles, that is to say we need some kind of a sensible dispersion relation. Uh, between the, the energy and the momentum of the particles so we can apply forces to them uh, and see them move around. We need a distance dependent potential energy that is interactions between the particles. And then we need some way to suck entropy out of the system uh, to cool it into an ordered state. Um, and so what we'd like to do is think about how to realize these ingredients with light. So the first challenge is that forces don't slow photons down. If I have a uh, uh, a massive particle moving to the right, a baseball, and I apply a force to the left, what I see is that the baseball slows down and then moves back to the left. What happens if I have this blue photon moving to the right and I apply a force to the left? Well, it changes color. It doesn't slow down at all. Of course, light always moves at the speed of light. So there's nothing wrong with that, but if we wanna make a material from these particles, they kind of need to be able to repel each other and slow down and move apart again. So we need to fix that. So the first question is, you know, qualitatively, what is the difference between these two things that causes that? And it's this idea that the relationship between the energy and the momentum of a photon is linear. What a force does is it changes the momentum of the photon, right? Um, 
But since the velocity is the derivative of the energy with respect to the momentum, when you apply a force, you change the momentum, but you don't change the velocity. So that's no good. Uh, and so what we'll see is that we just need to trap the light in some kind of a medium that changes its dispersion, okay? And uh, that means that when we apply forces to the photons, the slope changes as the momentum changes and thus the velocity changes. So that's the way we're gonna solve problem number one. Uh, problem number two is when I have two electrons get near each other, uh, they have some distance dependent uh, interaction energy that produces uh, a force and induces collisions. But what we know from Maxwell's equations is if I have a solution moving to the right and a solution moving to the left, well, the sum of those two solutions is a solution. Those two photons will go straight through each other. We have no collisions whatsoever. So the question is, how are we going to generate collisions between photons? Well, you might ask, what was the origin of these collisions between electrons? Well, in quantum electrodynamics, we say these electrons exchange a virtual photon as they get close together. Um, and so can we be inspired by that and uh, have a pair of, uh, of photons exchange a virtual electron to induce a collision? Well, no, um, that's not allowed. Uh, it's disallowed by, uh, by all of the things, according to my high energy colleagues. Um, but the point is that you can draw higher order Feynman diagrams that are allowed. Often they're extremely small, but the basic idea is uh, to use matter to induce interactions between photons. And so we will need to have some, some atoms in this story um, and we will use them to mediate interactions between the photons, okay? Um, okay, so the typical place where we study materials is systems of electrons where the Coulomb interaction between the electron generates this potential, okay? Um, and the electrons live in some uh, ion lattice and that ion lattice can modify the dispersion of the electrons. It gives us these bands uh, and change the effective mass of the electrons and so forth. And the interplay of these two things is what causes the ordering of the electrons and gives us the material properties we're interested in studying. So what I'm going to tell you about instead is taking photons and having them interact with each other. And we'll use some, some sort of a, 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 atoms or a, superconductors or something to do that. And then we will trap those photons in metamaterials. And those metamaterials will change the dispersion of the light and give us uh, the effective mass for the photons, okay? Uh, and so the, the sort of key requirements here is that these metamaterials need to be extremely low loss because we won't be able to induce really, really strong in, in absolute units interactions between these photons. And so what we need to do is keep the photons alive for a very long time in whatever is holding them so that the weak interactions have time to induce strong correlations and entanglement. Uh, and, and ordering of individual photons in the material. So this work is sort of a combination of quantum optical tools to make the photons interact and what one might call metamaterial engineering, but at that ultra, ultra low loss limit uh, so that we can combine it with our quantum optics tools. So this is sort of uh, the, the end of the first piece of the story. And I realized the thing that, um, I didn't do is ask, do you take questions during the talk, Babak, or should I just uh, power onwards? Yeah, we are open to taking questions during the talk. You can raise your hand and I will uh, alert John to. Okay. So, so anyway, this is uh, the important thing to note here is that this is Emmy the cat. For those of you who arrived a little early, you got to meet her already. Uh, she's leash trained. Um, and so if, if you'd like, we can take her for a walk at the end of the talk while we talk physics. Um, anyway, so this is the sort of basic uh, sort of set of, set of ideas that we're operating within. Uh, and then the point is that we need to implement these ideas in uh, physical systems, right? So one physical system you might think about using would be uh, optical photons trapped, trapped in optical cavities. And another physical system you might think about working with is microwave photons trapped in superconducting microwave cavities. And I'm gonna tell you stories uh, sort of about each of those. And the first story I wanna tell you uh, is about building topological matter from optical photons. But the problem with that is what I found is that people don't really have that much of an intuitive understanding 
uh, of what it means to build topological matter, what topological matter even is. I know this uh, from my own experience. I sort of learned about these ideas as we were starting to uh, think about how to study them with photons. So what I wanna do is give you sort of an experimentalist introduction to, uh, to the fractional quantum Hall effect. Uh, and just, uh, so the first, I think, hour and a half of the talk will be that. Uh, oh, oh no, we're not doing that? Sorry, my bad. Um, so so I just, just very briefly, uh, let's go back to your uh, graduate uh, quantum mechanics um, and see if we can get some intuition for how uh, particles behave in magnetic fields. So if I have an electron in a magnetic field, what I know is that I get little cyclotron orbits uh, of the electron around the field, uh, the field direction, if it's pointing, say, into the page. And this is true wherever I place the electron. I have this nice translational invariance. Wherever the electron is, it'll orbit around some local center, okay? Um, similarly, as I increase the velocity of the electron, the orbit gets, uh, the, the orbital size changes, but the, uh, but the orbital period doesn't change. And so we can kind of put these two ideas together to get some intuition about what's gonna happen quantum mechanically, okay? There's gonna be some kind of translational invariance and we're gonna have discrete energies because the point is since we only have sort of discrete frequencies in the dynamics, only multiples of, uh, of that frequency will be, uh, will be the allowed energies of the system, okay? And so indeed, um, if we look at this system quantum mechanically, what we find is that we have uh, these discrete energies that are allowed that are multiples of this cyclotron energy. And at each of those energies, we have a massive degeneracy of states corresponding to the translational invariance uh, of the system. And these are called Landau levels. We're gonna think only about this lowest Landau level of the system. Um, and indeed, it turns out thinking about how the translational invariance appears is a little subtle. So what I'm gonna do is instead write the eigenstates sort of in terms of their angular momentum with respect to some guiding center. Um, and unfortunately for all of you, we actually need to write down what the eigenstates are. Um, so I'd like you to just turn your brain on to 100% for the next 30 seconds, because this does become important shortly. Uh, and then we can go back to storytelling mode. The statement is that I can write the single particle eigenstates about this guiding center uh, in terms of uh, the X and Y coordinates, but I'm gonna write X plus I, Y is this coordinate Z, okay? And that's convenient because then I can write these eigenstates as Z to the L, E to the minus magnitude of Z squared, right? And then I can write Z as R, E to the I theta. And so I have one piece, which is R to the L, E to the minus R squared. And that gives this ring shape, okay? And this E to the I L theta says that I have uh, two pi L of phase winding. Uh, in the phase of this single particle wave function as I go around the ring, meaning that I have like L H bar units of angular momentum in this state psi sub L. So this is just uh, sort of quantifying the states of this lowest Landau level. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is add interactions between these particles. So I'm just gonna say, we have the single particle physics of a particle in a magnetic field. And all we wanna do on top of that is say, when two particles are at the same location, we pay some interaction energy, okay? And this is the Hamiltonian for that. And so the question you ought to ask yourself is, if these interactions are not strong enough to excite the particles from one Landau level to another, then uh, what can they do? Well, it turns out there it's very simple. Uh, they will have to conserve angular momentum um, and they have to conserve energy. And so if I have particles with one and four units of angular momentum, well, they can collide and become particles with two and three units or zero and five units and so forth. So these collisions sort of exchange angular momentum between the particles. John, it looks like we have a question. Yeah, there is a question. Stephen, you can go ahead. Oh. Sorry, you're muted still. Thanks for walking us through the Hamiltonian. Uh, again, sort of on a learning curve here. If these are electrons, there's an exclusion principle. So if they're sitting at the same location, they kind of have the same spin. So yeah, so we have to be a little careful here 
I have assumed that the magnetic field is large enough that the cloud is entirely spin polarized. Okay. Um, and so they all have the same spin. Uh, and what I have sort of ignored is the anti-symmetrization of the wave function, which we will impose shortly. So as you've correctly noted, one, I certainly can't put two particles in the same orbital, right? Because then they would have some overlap in space. But you might also worry if you look at the L equals two and L equals three states, the outer edge of this one has some overlap with the inner edge of that one, right? And so that mm -hmm. might suggest that if I had one particle in each of those orbitals, that would violate mm -hmm. Pauli exclusion. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you anti-symmetrize the wave function, you don't have that issue. You're good. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So far, so good? Um, you should put your hand down, though, because um, uh, it's good to keep me honest. But you won't. I won't know to stop again if you don't put your hand down. Uh, so so great. So 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 far so good. We can see the kinds of processes that are allowed. The question that you then want to ask is, what is the ground state of this system? Well, it looks like a freaking mess, doesn't it? It's almost like somebody should have gotten a Nobel Prize for figuring out the ground state of this Hamiltonian, and it turns out they did. Um, this is the, uh, the Laughlin state. I've wrote it, written it for bosons here, but we can think about it for fermions uh, because, uh, because we had this nice question. Um, the basic point is the, the ground state is going to need to have all of the particles in that lowest Landau level. And we're gonna need to keep the particles away from one another. Um, why do we need to keep them away from one another? Sort of two reasons. Uh, one reason is uh, is Pauli exclusion, and the and the other reason is this repulsion. So um, I'm now realizing there was probably another aspect to that question, which is I've written out contact interactions here, right? And how can you have contact interactions for fermions? And and I think that's a fair complaint. Qualitatively speaking, it doesn't really matter. Uh, at what, what the form is of these interactions. You sort of expand them in terms of these Haldane pseudo potentials, but you can treat this as sort of any interaction which is central and wants to keep the particles away from one another. So for bosons, it's okay for it to be contact. And yes, I agree, that's a very good point. For fermions, this should, this should have be some ranged interaction. Okay, but so the basic idea then is that, uh, we need to keep the wave function in this lowest Landau level. And so Z1 is the position of the first electron, Z2 the second, Z3 the third. And the point is that this thing that I've written down here, each term in this product will one, for each Z have some power of that Z times E to the minus magnitude of that Z squared. Meaning this will be a sum of terms where each particle is in the lowest Landau level, which is what we wanted, right? So we have a many body state, which is in the lowest Landau level. As long as this power is odd, that state will be anti-symmetric with respect to exchange of particles. So it will satisfy Pauli exclusion, right? And indeed the higher I make this power, the further apart I keep my particles, right? And so, if I make the power one, it turns out that just satisfies Pauli exclusion. Um, and, uh, and that's the sort of integer quantum Hall regime where I haven't really seen any effective interactions. And as I make the power higher and higher, I can keep the, keep the particles further and further apart. So anyway, Laughlin got the Nobel prize for working on this with electrons. Um, and we would like to study this physics with photons, which are bosons, so we'll need an even power here, um, and then uh, and and then see what we can see. Um, and uh, you know, there are all kinds of ideas about uh, uh, fractionally charged excitations, fractional statistics for excitations. But step zero is to sort of realize this physics in a system that's uh, uh, simple and uh, and and a little more manageable to control. So, what do we need to do? if we want to study this with photons. Well, we need to make the photons behave as though they live in a magnetic field. We need a Lorentz force for photons. And then we need to make the photons interact with each other. 
So, uh, so how do we do those two things? Um, well, this is going to be a story about uh, cavity quantum electrodynamics. Um, and, uh, and so indeed, there are uh, all kinds of different ways that people use cavities to make light interact with matter, uh, to manipulate the dispersion of light, and so forth. Uh, I would say our work is in some ways most similar to these kinds of ideas with exciton polaritons uh, coming from uh, the group at Stanford and from Atach's group, uh, at sort of hybridized with, with ideas from uh, Rydberg polaritons in free space uh, from, uh, from the Harvard group, uh, and, and also Martin Weitz's photon BEC experiments. So um, what is the analogy that I would like you to, uh, to understand here? Well, what I'm going for is this idea that photons in a multimode resonator uh, are not massive particles, but they behave in their dynamics within the resonator as though they have mass and as though they are harmonically trapped. So what, how does this come to be? Well, the essential idea, what do I mean for starters, is if I have two mirrors here and I shine light into this cavity away from the cavity axis and I watch how the light moves back and forth inside the cavity, the photonic wave packet or you know, classical light wave packet, whatever, uh, behaves like a massive harmonically trapped particle. Okay, um, so we can understand this a little bit more intuitively in a ray picture. If I just watch the ray as it bounces back and forth between the mirrors in the cavity, um, and I see where it hits this central plane. This is slightly displaced. I'm sorry about that. Um, these, uh, these dots are supposed to be the points where the particle intersects this middle, uh, the, this central plane of the cavity. And what you can kind of understand is that, um, you know what, this is important enough. I'm going to fix it because I can. There we go. Um, There we go. Oh, yeah. Um, and so the idea is this is like a discrete time evolution of, uh, of a harmonically trapped particle. You can see it's speeding up in the middle. The dots are getting further apart. It's slowing down at the top and bottom. OK, uh, and so the idea uh, basically of why this is happening is that the ray is moving back and forth longitudinally. The curvature of the mirrors changes the direction of the ray. That's providing our harmonic confinement. OK, and the length of the cavity translates a tilt of the ray into a transverse displacement. And so that kind of gives the photon mass, right? You can apply a force up and down due to the curvature of the mirrors in this case to speed or slow the motion in the vertical direction. And lest you worry that this is hand wavy, let me say that for one, you can build a very formal floquet picture of what's going on here. Uh, and also this applies in a wave picture as well. So what we know is that the modes of a quantum harmonic oscillator are Hermit Gauss in space and uniformly spaced in energy. Uh, and of course, if any of you have ever made a laser resonator, you know that the exact eigenmodes of this laser resonator are Hermit Gauss in space and uniformly spaced in energy. And so the picture you should have in your mind is if I send the light into this cavity off center, I can decompose that into the modes of the cavity um, that will destructively interfere on the left and constructively interfere on the right. But a little bit of time later, there's some you know, these modes aren't at the same frequency. So that plus sign turns into a minus sign and the photon appears on the left side. If this sounds like a story you've heard before, it's because you learned about it in undergraduate quantum mechanics, right? This is how coherent states, not in, uh, not in photon number, but in, you know, uh, for a harmonic oscillator, move back and forth in space. And we're just saying a photon in the cavity behaves like a quantum harmonic oscillator in space. Okay, great. Uh, and so this is the picture you should have in your mind. We've got these two mirrors. The photon is delocalized everywhere along the cavity axis, but it oscillates back and forth transversely like a, like a massive harmonically trapped particle. Okay, so, so that's really nice. What we can kind of see is that the mirror curvature was giving us our trapping and the propagation along the cavity axis is kind of giving the photons their mass. Right, So we've got the p squared term and we've got the x squared term, but what we would love is an xp term because that's what a magnetic field is. 
right? And what I would like to convince you of is that twisting this cavity out of the plane gives us this XP term, okay? So, so what does that even mean, twist the cavity out of the plane? Uh, let's talk briefly about periscopes. If you've ever watched a submarine movie, you know the submarine captain has to turn the whole periscope, right, to look in different directions. Why can't you just turn the top mirror with respect to the bottom mirror? Well, let's talk about how a periscope works. I've got this high resolution, ultra realistic tree rendering here, and you can watch it uh, move through the periscope. Um, works great. What if the top mirror is rotated 90 degrees with respect to the bottom mirror? Well, then the tree is rotated by 90 degrees. You don't really want that. Uh, but the point, is, so that's why they don't do that in a submarine. Although with modern submarines, you would imagine they could do that on rotation digitally. But that's another story for another day. Um, the point is, as you rotate the top mirror with respect to the bottom mirror, you rotate this image. Uh, and so our cavities are gonna be, instead of two mirror cavities, four mirror cavities, where we take this rotation and then just have two more mirrors to close the path back on itself, okay? Like so. So we've got this cavity rotated out of the plane. And the point is that now on every round trip through the cavity, the image gets rotated a little bit. So this turns the lab frame into a rotating frame, okay? And what we know, depending on where you're from, if you're Russian, you learn this in elementary school. If you're American, you probably learned it in high school or college, is that when you're living in a rotating frame, um, you get these fictitious forces. Of course, for us, this, this rotating frame is the lab frame. So these are real forces on the photons. You get a Coriolis force and you get a centrifugal force. A Coriolis force looks like omega cross P right? And the centrifugal force looks like omega squared times r, right? So omega squared times r is just like living on top of a bowl. It's anti-harmonic trapping, right? And so we can just cancel that with mirror curvature, right? Uh, the interesting term is the omega cross p term, because omega cross p is basically the same as v cross b. And so what that says is when we cancel this centrifugal force term, with the mirror curvature. Well, now we no longer have any harmonic trapping because these canceled out. And what we should be left with, in fact, is, uh, is just um, this uh, Lorentz force on the photons. So, so the idea is uh, to, uh, to, to have a cavity like this, it's, which is a 2D harmonic oscillator, okay? This is the lowest mode. We've got two first excited modes along X and Y, and then a second excited mode along X, doubly excited mode along Y, excited along X and Y and so forth. And then as we twist this cavity, we should start to get this Lorentz force is one way to think about it. The other way to think about it is on each round trip through the cavity, the image gets rotated a little bit. Right? Well, if your image gets rotated, then the point is that this can no longer be an eigenmode because eigenmode means you come back to yourself up to a phase under a round trip, right? And this is not that up to a phase, right? They're qualitatively different. So we need sums of these two states that, uh, that are invariant under rotation and that'll be ranks, right? And so what you'll find is that as soon as you twist this cavity out of the plane, the modes become rings, right? And when you have just the right amount of twist that the centrifugal force cancels the harmonic trapping, uh, these modes become degenerate. The other way to think about that, let's go back. Oops, I don't know what's going, there's, some, there's something wrong with that slide. I don't know what it is. Well, maybe today is not the time to figure that out. Um, the, uh, the basic point I wanna make is once you've got a ring, uh, this mode plus I times that mode, or this mode minus I times that mode. When you go around that ring, you have to ask yourself, does the phase winding go with the rotation or against? And if the phase winding goes with, the energy goes down. If the phase winding goes against the rotation, the energy goes up, okay? And so that's sort of equivalent to uh, if you want the Lorentz force here. And when you get to this point where all of these modes are degenerate, well, that's your lowest Landau level situation. Okay, so I should say there's a whole other story here coming from hitting the mirrors off axis and astigmatism and Landau levels on cones that we're going to skip entirely for today. The important point for our purposes is we take a bunch of very expensive fancy mirrors and at lowest order we stick them into a crappy 3D printed plastic structure. Um, and we see these nice ring modes 
right? Uh, which uh, which are the these uh, Lagur Gauss modes, if you want, or the modes of the of the lowest Landau level. And then we make the thing a little bit fancier so that we can vary the length of the cavity uh, to effectively vary the twist. Because remember, we can't really vary the curvature of the mirrors. Um, well, you can, but it's uh, it's sort of irreversible. And pretty quickly, your mirror becomes about 30 mirrors. Each one is very sharp and can cut you easily. Um, but so the point is, as we kind of vary the length of the cavity, we can go to this lowest Landau level situation where all of these modes become degenerate. Okay, and then you can zoom in and you can ask how degenerate can we make the modes and we can make them degenerate in this in this first cavity to uh, a couple of megahertz. And this number is rather important because what we now need to do is add interactions between these photons that are going to allow us to take photons in those modes and have them order within the modes to make some sort of topological state to make a Laughlin state. Uh, and so what this says is that we need interactions on the scale of a couple of megahertz. Okay, so as I said, there are all kinds of stories just exploring the classical topology of the, of the classical waves um, that I'll skip today, but I just wanted to flash this up here uh, so that if somebody is wondering about those stories, they can uh, take a look um, on, uh, on, on the archives and in the journals. Okay. So the second piece of this challenge is how are we going to make these photons interact with each other, right? Um, and, uh, and this piece requires that we have some kind of material medium for the photons to interact with. And so um, because this is an audience that I think is not really a cold atom audience, I thought this would be a fun opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, how slow light works and uh, how you can use that to mediate interactions between these photons. So I know Andrea has heard this uh, story probably a billion times uh, from 38 different cold atom people. So he'll have to forgive me, but the rest of you, uh, maybe we'll get to hear something kind of fun here. So when I send light through uh, an atomic medium, what we know in general is that the light slows down, right? The, light, the medium has some index of refraction, right? So the reason that we're used to for that light uh, slowing down is kind of that uh, the, the atoms are scattering the light. And so it's maybe getting back scattered a little bit in the medium. Um, the atoms are holding on to the photons for some amount of time. Uh, so you get a little bit of slowing. You get like a factor of two. Of course, when the light is propagating as light, it always moves at the speed of light. Like we know that as a rule, we're not breaking that. Okay, but what we do know is that when the light comes out the other side of the medium, right, uh, it can it can come out as though uh, it, it 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 was moving more slowly due to things like backscattering uh, and temporary absorption. So uh, electromagnetically induced transparency is um, a way of using the fact that if you have an atomic state which is really really long lived, you can have your photon enter the medium be absorbed by your atoms on some short-lived, very strong transition, okay? And then use a strong laser to excite whichever atom absorbed that photon up to a very long-lived state, okay? Here we're exciting up to a Rydberg state, um, but you could also excite to another ground state, which is long-lived. And the point is, then the photon can't move at all because it's some excitation of your atomic cloud, right? And the, and the atom is, uh, is just sitting there holding your photon as an atomic excitation. Uh, and then the atom can re-emit the photon. And because it's some uh, collective excitation of many different atoms that have particular phases based on the direction the light was traveling, that ensemble will then re-emit in the same direction that it absorbed from and the light will continue, okay? But this, this can only happen uh, uh, if, if all of these atoms can absorb this light. Okay, and we pick a Rydberg state with a long lifetime so the light can go extremely slowly through this cloud. Okay, but here's the interesting bit. What happens if a second photon tries to enter the medium whilst there's already a first photon in there that's been absorbed by the atoms? Well, we're using a Rydberg state uh, for a particular reason here, which is that we use say the 112th uh, Rydberg state of these atoms, n equals 112, we use d. And the point is the electronic orbital there is microns in diameter, right? It's gigantic. 
And so what that means is if the second photon needs to be absorbed by an atom, which is near the first photon, the electron-electron interactions shift that Rydberg state's energy, right? Uh, by enough that the second photon actually, if it gets near the first photon, that's why the color has changed here. The medium just looks transparent, right? It can't be absorbed by the atoms anymore, right? If the second photon, the red one, gets near the first photon, the black one, right? And so what that means in practice is out here, that red photon uh, moves nice and slowly. You know, it can be absorbed by the atoms and then re-emitted. Over here, that's the case as well. In the middle, it moves at the speed of light, right? And this spatially dependent speed is like a lens, right? And so that means that the second photon can actually lens the first photon. And you can think of this situation where one photon kind of creates a bubble for the other as generating an effective interaction between the photons, right? But you need to have enough atoms in this region that uh, this Rydberg interaction can create a bubble that's optically thick so it can, can induce the lensing. So you need a high Rydberg state um, and you need a relatively high density of atoms. Uh, and that's kind of uh, what we've realized in our experiment. And so what you should imagine is that our mirrors are making the photons massive and harmonically trapped and in synthetic magnetic fields. And then we put a cloud of atoms in here to make the photons effectively interact with each other. Okay, so what does this look like in practice? We magneto-optically trap a cloud of atoms. We load them into a, uh, a, an optical lattice that we transport into this optical cavity. Um, and then if you look from the side, this is an actual image of the uh, atomic cloud. And this is the cavity mode kind of to scale. It's like 20 microns across. What we then do is we compress this cloud down to you know, five or 10 microns thick. Um, so that we want to avoid a situation where photon, uh, an atom here and an atom there don't interact with each other. Uh, and so that the picture you should have in mind is that you could have a photon here and a photon there that don't interact, but photons can't kind of line up longitudinally in the cavity. We've kind of made a 2D gas of photons. So step zero is to do this with a single mode cavity, right? And you should think of that as like an electronic quantum dot, okay? There's only one spatial wave function of photon that's allowed in the problem. Uh, and now we can do spectroscopy on that system, okay? We can say, let's send light into the cavity and see what energies can go through. Well, for those of you who are cavity QED gurus, you'll recognize these tiny little peaks as the vacuum Rabi peaks of the cavity, uh, cavity atom system. Um, and then we have this really tall, narrow peak in the middle, which is uh, uh, cr creating Rydberg excitations of the light. And it's narrow because the Rydberg states are very long lived. Uh, and so this middle peak is where all of our action is gonna be. And what we wanna do is send light into the cavity at the energy of this uh, cavity EIT Rydberg peak. And what we expect to see is that once there's a photon in the cavity, the energy of the cavity mode has shifted and then you can't send in a second photon, okay? Uh, until the first photon has leaked out, at which point a second one can enter. And so indeed, um, you measure this by looking at the, the G2 correlator between the photons. And, uh, and what we observe is that uh, the cavity can hold one photon at a time. Conditioned on getting a photon at time zero, this is the sort of uh, the, the rate of getting photons out you know, some microseconds later. And what you see is that at early times, you never get a second photon out. Uh, and then uh, that rate comes back up at later times. So, so this works beautifully. The last piece of this story, um, and I am gonna sort of jump through this. I have, to, uh, I have to apologize for that because I wanna tell you a little bit about microwave photons as well, is to combine these magnetic fields and photon-photon scattering to sort of make a Laughlin state of light. So what does this look like qualitatively? To me, this is the interesting piece of this story. What I just told you is that if I shine light into the lowest mode of this cavity, it acts like a quantum dot. I can put one photon in, but once there's a photon in there, I can't put a second photon in until the first one leaks out. And this is this kind of blockade physics, okay? Which is akin to Coulomb blockade for electrons. So the question is, 
what happens if I repeat that experiment in this L equals one mode of the cavity with angular momentum? Well, you might think, well, it should be the same story, except this orbital is a little bit bigger, so that interaction energy will be a little smaller. But remember when I told you before, two photons with one unit of angular momentum can actually collide, right, and become a photon with zero units of angular momentum and a photon with two units of angular momentum, right? So now what we really need to ask is, is there some superposition of two photons with one unit of angular momentum and one with zero and one with two that keeps the photons away from each other? right, such that we pay no interaction energy and those pairs of photons can go through the cavity? And the answer is yes, right? That's what we started with at the beginning. That's this two photon Laughlin state, right? Because, uh, and then we can expand this out if you'd like, expand out the quadratic. This is Z1 squared Z2 to the zero plus uh, Z2 squared Z1 to the zero minus two Z1 Z2, which is effectively, a photon with two units of angular momentum and a photon with zero units or two photons with one unit. So what that says is if I send photons in with one unit of angular momentum, what should come out the other side of the cavity is a Laughlin state of light. So you can kind of think of this cavity as a Laughlin filter, okay? Um, and so experimentally, we do this with slightly different angular momentum modes, but the idea is that you send light into the cavity with orbital angular momentum, generated by a, a DMD, a, uh, you know, basically a data projector to change, to shape the phase of the light. You put these Rydbergs in the cavity to mediate interactions between the photons. And then you measure the angular momenta of the photons that come out and the spatial correlations of the photons that come out. Um, and, and indeed what you can see is um, for a single mode cavity, you get a very strong blockade, but once you've got these multiple modes, there's an extent to which photons are allowed to go through at the same time, right? And that should be this Laughlin state of light. Uh, and, and indeed, we can see that energy conservation is required as we move the, the, the individual eigenstates around. And when we do tomography and correct for a phase between the Rydberg atoms and the photons, we do make this, uh, this two photon uh, Laughlin state uh, of light. And so the idea moving forward is to sort of build on these techniques to, uh, to create uh, larger, uh, larger Laughlin states. Okay, so I think I have about nine minutes left uh, from the time uh, I started speaking. Um, so do we have questions at this point before we move on to, uh, to talking about uh, microwave photons and how to sort of autonomously stabilize uh, bigger states of light. Hi, Steve. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, thank you. So the effective mass, you didn't actually specify uh, what it was. And, and se secondly, this is just a thought experiment. If uh, photons can be given an effective mass, can they also be given effective moments of inertia and have some sort of uh, angular momentum that couples to spin momentum? So the, uh, let, let's answer those questions one at a time. Uh, the photon mass is just sort of dependent on the geometry of the cavity that we build. Um, and it ends up being a fraction of an electron mass in practice. Um, and, and in fact, the fact that it's, you know, a fraction of an electron mass is why we don't think about the atoms as moving around. We create these interactions between the photons through the atoms, but we essentially think of the atoms as infinitely massive because they're, you know, the mass is quantized as well. The mass of the photons is, uh, oh, it's yeah, it's, it's more or less, I mean, it's not, sorry, we should be careful. Is it quantized to an integer fraction of the electron mass? No. It, it is entirely coincidental, you know, that, uh, that the mass ends up as a fraction of the electron mass. You should think of it as having some rest mass, which is maybe like 0.6 something electron masses. Uh, and then it gets additional, it has a P squared over 2M term kind of thing. 
Uh, and then your second question about the uh, it definitely the photons definitely have a moment of inertia, you know the angular momentum is definitely quantized. Now there is a question about how you couple that uh, effectively to uh, to uh, say an electron spin. Uh, we've wanted for a while to play some kind of a game where uh, we transfer the orbital angular momentum of the photon. Um, onto the orbital angular momentum of an electron. The challenge in practice ends up being sort of a size mismatch between the trap for the photons. That is to say the size of the photonic orbitals and the size of the electronic orbitals. The electronic orbitals, if you're not really smart about the Rydberg state you're playing with, they're like angstroms in size, which means they more or less sit at the node of the optical field and, and, it's, and it's hard to transfer that momentum. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, uh, hi. So, um, so, so my question is, you know, so in your system, you have um, your photonic part uh, being rotating, right? So we're feeling the gauge field, so to speak, um, and the ma the matter part, the, the Rydberg atoms are more. Are, they are say, let's say normal, right? Uh, they don't feel any. So would would that would it be different um, if we were to let's say reverse these roles? Let's say if the Rydberg atoms were feeling a uh, gauge potential and the photon was in a normal cavity, or if both or, or if both these components had their own. Uh... So this is this is a really cool question, uh, and it gets sort of at the heart of what I was saying before. The basic point is that the atoms are so heavy that their motional dynamics are almost completely irrelevant on the timescales of the photon lifetimes, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So what does this mean? Uh, if you look back at early literature about how to potentially make gauge fields for light, one thing that people wanted to do was just take you know, a normal cavity or a normal free space situation and generate a gauge field for the atoms by rotating them, right? And the basic challenge that you run into is in the numbers. The atoms have to rotate so freaking fast that like you just can't hold on to them, right? Like it's, it's like speeds that we never realize in lab and cold atom experiments, just because like when the trap is that deep, you get all kinds of crazy start shifts and it's, it's just impossible. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess what I would say is one thing that we would like in the longer term is to get our polaritons sufficiently long lived, uh, you know, by trapping the Rydberg atoms in a uh, in, in, in a cryogenic environment, dealing with stray electric fields, so forth. If we could get the, the electronic excitations Long, long enough lived that, you know, it could be millisecond kind of lifetimes, right. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then the atomic motion could actually thermalize with the photonic motion. And you wouldn't just think of the atoms as like a stationary background mediator of interactions between the photons. Mm -hmm. You could then really start to think about back action between the two. You could play games where you laser cool the atoms and use that to suck entropy out of the uh, out of the right. photonic system yeah. because they're cross thermalizing, but but the time scales right now you saw everything happens in like microseconds from that yeah. G two mm -hmm. data within microseconds there's there's very little action uh, in the atomic sector. Okay, okay, thank you, mm -hmm. Andrea. Yeah, hi, Jonathan. So I have a question. Hi. How do you ensure that you excite just the ground state, this many body ground state of the Laughlin? state and not and uh, ending up to have more higher excited many body states so uh this is uh, again i think this really gets at the heart of these uh, questions of of what i want to talk briefly about next here it's a very special game that we've played where basically this blockade mechanism means that the only thing you can excite due to the strong photon photon repulsion is the Laughlin state, right? Because the argument is that is the only state that when you excite at the bare energy of this L equals one mode, you can put two photons in because any other state 
you have to pay extra interaction energy between the photons, right? So to me, that's sort of the cool thing about this idea. The only state where you don't pay interaction energy between the photons is the Laughlin state. So if you inject the right amount of angular momentum, which for two photons is two units of angular momentum, one, and we inject it one per photon, all you can make is that Laughlin state. Does that kind of make sense? So, and to me, this is an idea from Jacopo Carusotto. And what I think is really neat about the whole thing is that this idea of like, that's just what a Laughlin state is, right? Uh, and the, this connection between quantum optics kind of blockade ideas and topological few body physics ideas, I think is, uh, is pretty magical. But you, so, you make a good point in some sense. If you try to do this for two, for, for injecting with L equals two, you will be able to inject three photons. But then the problem is the interactions are a little weaker and it's a little harder. So how do you do this for more and more and more photons? What we need is some way to, to sort of thermalize into a Laughlin state. So the last little piece that I would like to tell here, I think I have 45 seconds. Um, so I think I'll take a little longer than that with your permission, Babak, but not much. Yeah, yeah. You can, you can take, um, I'll know, take five minutes. How does that minutes. sound? That's, that's fine. If that's okay. If it's not okay, uh, we can, uh, we cannot uh, do this piece. That's that, fine. That's absolutely fine. We usually, uh, allow more time than just the regular, say 15 minutes. Okay. 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 Then I'll, uh, I'll take a little extra time, but not too much. Okay. So what I want to tell you about now is another system. Uh, this one built in collaboration with, uh, with uh, my friend and colleague, Dave Schuster. And yes, we've stolen this publishing house logo. Um, what we would like is to uh, get important enough that they someday sue us, but I'm not holding my breath. Um, uh, and what, what we're trying to do is sort of study equilibration of strongly interacting quantum systems uh, using microwave photons. So uh, I'm going to skip this story about uh, what an insulator is and what a mod insulator is and how they're related to each other, because uh, this is a condensed matter audience. So I think that's kind of worth skipping. What I will say, though, is people have had a lot of ideas over a long time about how to study strongly interacting lattice physics of photons. Um, and I've been following that research for a while, and it wasn't until I uh, spent some time with Dave Schuster that I realized uh, in discussing with him uh, that his platform is really perfect for studying that. So people have all kinds of prick pictures of what this should look like. Our picture ended up looking a lot like the way Andrew Houck's group proposed to do it. Um, the basic idea is that if you want to make a lattice system where photons can hop from one lattice site to another and they repel each other if they're on the same lattice site, the first thing you need to do is realize a lattice site. Okay, and so our lattice site is just an LC circuit. Okay, and the way you should think about that is that uh, an LC circuit can hold photons whose energy is Planck's constant times one over root LC. So we set that to say 4.5 gigahertz. Okay, uh, so you can put a first photon in 4.5 gigahertz, second one 4.5 gigahertz, however many you want, always 4.5 gigahertz. That's great, except that we're not getting any interaction between the photons. What you'd like is for the second one to cost say 4.8 gigahertz. And that says that you have 300 megahertz of interaction between your photons. Well, one thing you know if you've ever played with LC circuits is if you drive enough current through them, the inductor gets hot. And when the inductor gets hot, it's shape changes. And when it shape changes, the inductance changes, right? The problem is that might require many amps of current and then your inductor melts. So you get uh, this frequency, uh, this photon number dependent frequency shift, but you needed 10 to the 15 photons and you could only do it once, right? What we need is some kind of an inductor whose properties change with only one photon in the inductor. Okay, and it turns out the best thing to do there is use a Josephson junction. Um, you can think of this as saying the phase uh, energy relation in a Josephson junction looks like cosine of phi instead of phi squared, uh, if you want. But the important point to me is just that the inductance depends on how much current is flowing through the, the junction. Okay, 
Um, and this is such a big effect that the first photon might be 4.5 gigahertz. And in fact, in the experiments, I'll tell you about the second photon is at 4.2 gigahertz. So we have like 300 megahertz of attraction between photons in this circuit, okay? Um, so then the next thing is we need to couple the lattice sites to one another. How do you do that? With a capacitor, right? So these are uh, all, these are called superconducting circuits. And now you can kind of see why they're called circuits. You literally pattern them on a, on a sapphire circuit board, right? And you can make these resonators and you can have photons tunnel back and forth from one to another. Uh, and you can use this attractive interaction between them to realize a kind of attractive Hubbard model, okay? I should also mention that uh, you've probably heard this object here, this uh, transmon capacitor resonator, or excuse me, uh, Josephson Junction capacitor resonator referred to as a transmon in the popular press, uh, and they call it a qubit. Well, why is it a qubit? Because if you just drive at 4.5 gigahertz, it now looks like a two level system, right? And so it, it looks like a quantum bit. And so now you can ask, well, how much tunneling do we have? We make the tunneling say 10 megahertz. We make the, this interaction energy 300 megahertz, much more than the tunneling. And then how long do the photons typically live before they're absorbed due to some res parasitic resistance? About 40 microseconds, maybe 100 at best. So this gives us like 400 tunneling times, 12,000 collision times. We can really start to make many body states here. Um, so we connect a bunch of these together and this will make our lattice. And then we need some way to prepare this thing in the ground state. So this relates to, uh, to Andrea's question. Um, how do we prepare the system in the ground state? Well, we would like a magical object that constantly refills itself with a photon whenever it's empty, okay? So it'll put a photon into your system, but only at this energy, and then it refills itself. And now that photo, it can't put another photon into the system because of this, you know, it would need to put a photon in at that energy, which it can't do. It only has photons at this energy. But once that photon hops over, it refills your system and then refills itself and so forth. And this will make a mod insulator of photons is the claim. And the point is this idea should work anytime you have a many body state where you put excitations in at some energy until you hit a gap. That is to say any incompressible fluid uh, is perfect for this kind of a, a stabilization approach, okay? So we have a whole nice theory paper on how this works. Uh, in fact, these ideas came uh, much earlier from people like uh, Jacopo Carasoto and Mohamed Hafezi and others, uh, uh, Elliot Caput. But the question is, how do we make uh, this object? I've already told you how to make this one, right, uh, from these uh, Josephson Junction capacitor resonators. How do we make this dissipative stabilizer? So I just want to show you how this works. For those of you who's ever thought about optical pumping or how lasers work, it's quite obvious actually how this object works. What we need to do, we can't just drive on this transition from zero photons to one photon because we want something that refills itself to one photon and then waits until that photon gets taken before refilling itself again. If we just drove it from zero to one photon with a microwave tone, that would then, once it put the photon in, it would then coherently take it back. Right, and you just get Robbie flopping between zero and one. We don't want that. So what we instead want to do is generate an inversion in this one state. And so what we need to do is excite it from zero to two, have two decay really fast to one, and then uh, we can't drive it anymore because we're only driving zero to two. So how does that work? Well, basically we take this transmon and we couple it to a lossy resonator that's resonant with this two to one transition. And then we just excite it from zero to two. So this all sounds very obvious, but the cool thing is this gives you a totally new way of making materials out of light. This object works beautifully. This is now effectively a chemical potential, it turns out, um, for light. Uh, and indeed, you can put these ingredients together. You can see this interaction energy shift very clearly in spectroscopy. You can see tunneling back and forth in a double well. You can see tunneling in a quadruple well in space. Uh, in this direction, in time, in that direction. And then you can put all these pieces together. Um, don't worry about this figure on the left. These are the various sites of the system. Time flies vertically, and the system just fills up from empty 
to, uh, to one photon per site. It just really works beautifully. Uh, and so the idea now is to uh, improve the performance of these various platforms such that we can really combine all of these ideas together to, uh, to dissipatively stabilize large many body states of light uh, and explore the sort of correlations. This is just looking at the density of this fluid. You can now explore correlations uh, in this driven dissipatively stabilized uh, many body state of light. Um, so uh, I think what I will do is uh, skip the, 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 the rest, um, skip the outlook even, uh, and just ask if there are any questions. And if people want to stick around, I can show you Outlook slides later. But uh, these are the folks who really did the work. So I think, uh, you know, some people like to put those slides at the beginning. Maybe I should have done that. But, uh, but, but the, these are the folks uh, who, who really deserve the accolades for, uh, for having made the science go. So thank you for, uh, for, for hanging out through the talk. This has been uh, stimulating and fun. Thank you, John. Um, great talk. We have time for some questions. Maybe I'll ask a question, just kind of wondering along the way. Mm -hmm. um, when you create these um, state and, you know, um, these photon uh, orbital functions and everything, what role does the polarization play of photons? That is a really good question. Um, but look, Steve, your questions were good too. Bob Ox wasn't better. <laughs> it was just also really good. Um, so I've, I've completely left the polarization out of the story. That's right. Uh, the idea is uh, when, you, when you go through this cavity, undergo a round trip, the polarization also gets rotated, right? All vector quantities that live in that transverse plane get rotated. And so what this means is that the, the modes of this cavity um, for the two, so now the eigenmodes are gonna be circular polarizations is the first point, right? We're used to cavities with linearly polarized eigenmodes. This one has circularly polarized eigenmodes. So effectively you have a right circularly polarized lowest Landau level and the left circularly polarized lowest Landau level, right? And we only worry about one of the two. You know, it's like in fractional quantum hall physics, you don't worry about the spin degree of freedom of the electron because they're, the two spins are separated in energy. We effectively have the same physics here for polarization. There's one more subtlety though, which is this is a running wave cavity, right? So you can go A, B, C, D, or you can go D, C, B, A for your propagation direction around the cavity. So you might worry about, do those hybridize, right? So this then is actually much like, um, the Kramer's degeneracy in, in, a, uh, uh, in a topological insulator. Uh, and what, what you find is that basically because to backscatter from one to the other, you have to flip the polarization as well. Um, that backscattering process is very strongly suppressed. And we've actually been starting to measure that more quantitatively because now that our cavities use lenses instead of mirrors, the backscattering seems like it would be worse. But what you discover is that you actually get two kinds of protection from backscattering. One, because the forward mode is polarized like this and the backwards mode is polarized like that, so they can't scatter into each other. And the other, because the angular momentum in the forward direction goes like this and the backward direction goes like that. And so what you can see is that in fact, the backscattering is angular momentum mode dependent and it's already extremely weak due to this polarization suppression. And then it's like orders of magnitude weaker as you go to larger. So I would call this a direct measurement of the gauge of, mm -hmm. the, uh, of the system, just to offend as many theorists as I possibly can. Um, but uh, in, in some sense in our system, gauge is manifestly a real thing because we have a 2D system living in a 3D world. So I don't know if that was the question you were asking. But, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, great, thank you. And I think Puneet has a question as well. Yeah, um, I actually have two questions. Uh, uh, the first one, uh, you, you've probably been asked this many times, but uh, 
the, the, in in your in the cavity, um, there is no uh, time reversal symmetry breaking, right? And and I wanted to ask, how does the absence of time reversal symmetry breaking, as opposed, you know, in contrast to what happens with electrons uh, in a magnetic field, how does that, or what kind of differences does it give in in, in physics? Yeah. Uh, so this is, and I would, then I will come to the next one. Okay. So I think this is a really great question. It comes back to Babak's question, actually, a little bit about polarizations, um, and and forward versus backward. So fundamentally, I told you a story in this cavity as though time reversal symmetry was broken, right? We only talked about modes with positive angular momentum, right? Yes. But, yes, you, yes. but you can only have that if you break time reversal symmetry. So in some sense, what you're telling me is that I'm a liar. And, and <laughs> you, know, you know what? I'm not gonna take that personally. I think it's a little bit forward, right? Like I've come here as a friend and you called me a liar. But no, I'm just kidding. Um, but it's, I think it's a wonderful question. Uh, and the fundamental point is the thing that preserves the time reversal symmetry is that you have a pair of degenerate lowest Landau levels, okay? One that propagates mm -hmm. between the mirrors A, B, C, D, right? And one that propagates D, C, B, A, okay? Yes, and yes, effectively, yes. those two lowest Landau levels experience opposite magnetic fields in exact analogy to a spin hall system, right? Where one spin state experiences a magnetic field out of the board and the other experiences a magnetic field into the board, right? Now, the problem, are you familiar with this with spin hall? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I can so shift, yes. The problem with spin hall is that magnetic impurities very easily flip up spins into down spins, right? Mm -hmm. So we say we have this protection due to time reversal symmetry, right? But in a real material, time reversal symmetry is not a very well protected quantity, right? Because any magnetic impurity messes it up. So, yes, exactly. yeah. so the question is here, what would be the equivalent of a magnetic impurity? Well, mm -hmm. it's anything yes. that backscatters, mm -hmm. right? From the forwards modes, into the backwards modes, right? So mm -hmm. then you might say, well, then doesn't any fleck of dust on any optic, any imperfection on anything induce that sort of backscattering? And more to the point, when I have these Rydberg-Rydberg interactions that make these little bubbles, can't I backscatter off of the bubbles, right? Well, it turns out you're protected from that by a variety of things. One is that these two degenerate Landau levels, one that's propagating forward and one that's propagating backward, have the same helicity, which means that, which is their, their polarization dotted into the propagation vector, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're time reversal partners of each other. But right. because they have the same helicity, they have opposite polarizations with respect to a fixed axis. Right. So now the polarizations are taking the role of spins, is uh, is what you're saying, and they're linear polarizations. Well, we have to be careful because spin was actually whether it's going A B C D through the cavity or D C B A. But what mm -hmm. I'm telling you is that in fact, it's both. Right? Spin, mm -hmm. if you want, really is A B C D cross sigma plus or D C B A cross sigma minus, right? And so something that converts sigma uh, DCBA into ABCD isn't enough, right? We're doubly right. protected, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so as a consequence, you also have to flip the polarization. And so a defect which is very small compared to lambda can potentially do that. But a defect which is large, which is typically what we have, these are very smooth mirrors, does not do that. Mm -hmm. Right. So you get very good protection there. And then the other thing, the last one, is that because the magnetic fields are opposite, um, the local gauge in the lowest Landau level is different. You can think of it in this way. Um, the gauge kind of tells you if this is the, the 
the central plane of the cavity, the light's propagating around like this, okay? Um, the gauge in the symmetric gauge kind of goes in a circle. Is that familiar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here, what that means is, uh, I'll now point it at you. If yes. this is the center of the cavity axis, the, the ray in the lowest Landau level goes this way. If you're out here, the rays go that way. If you're over here, the rays go that way. So uh -huh. the gauge is manifestly the direction the rays move in the lowest Landau level. And it's mm -hmm. opposite for things mm -hmm. in with the magnetic field pointing this way versus that way. So as a consequence, even if you flipped all of those other things, right? You would need to take a ray that's going like this and convert it into a ray that's going like that, which is mm -hmm. like a weird kind of disorder. And so, you know, we've only recently started to really understand how fortunate we were, right? Uh, but, but you are, there's just like all kinds of symmetry protection preventing this backscattering. Okay. 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 That's, that's cool. That you can, you cool. can also call it tenure protection. Right, uh, it's which is similar to, uh, in my case, backscatter protection. Okay, great question. Yours was better than Babak's. <laughs> Actually, can, can I can I ask uh, one more? Just um, I just said uh, uh, um, to continue. Um, so now, can I think of your uh, system? Let uh, let's say there's a single red bug atom and the cavity um, as as a single side, I, I, I'm, I'm just really, you know, just speaking of the top of my head. Yeah, so as a single side, and if I had a uh, two-dimensional version of this, um, or if I had 2D, 2D cavities, uh, you know, planar cavities, um, would it really, and, and I'm just looking in plane at, at what's going on, and I could inject a certain linear momentum, would you sort of get a, Lorentz force. If you just if you fix where you're looking from, uh, so here's what I would say: forget about the Rydbergs. If you just want to see a yeah, Lorentz yeah, force, right. then all you have to do is inject light with in some the cavity with with a wave packet, which mm -hmm. is short in time compared right. to the spacing between the Landau levels. So mm -hmm. we never do that. We always just use the lowest Landau level physics, but. Yeah. For us, the spacing between the Landau levels is a couple hundred megahertz. So we could, in principle, make a very short pulse and then watch a cyclotron orbit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this Absolutely. would really be like a Lorentz force. If you if you limit yourself to the two D plane, then it's 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 done. It's mm -hmm. like a magnetic field essentially. Okay. Yeah, exactly. But the challenge yes, yes. is that our interactions are only a couple of megahertz, right? So yes. those photons would just run each other over. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. Andrea. Hi, Jonathan. So I was wondering about the experiment with Schuster. Since now you have this amazing dissipative way to create uh, this uh, Hubbard, Hamiltonian, many body states. So do you already have plans how to, I don't know, how to engineer a pyre, so pyre's phase or artificial gauge fields, kind of uh, yeah. importing what you have done with photons now in this other photons experiment? So I, um, skipped, I skipped that entirely. So this is a small version of that that we've now got one qubit in. Uh, the, the way to think about this, this is a 2D lattice of superconducting resonators, okay? Let's ignore the qubit for a moment, okay? You need to induce a pyrrole phase. Uh, and so actually, let me just bring up the right slide for that. That slide is... Yeah, probably one of these slides. Let's just unhide all of those slides and go from there. Um, the, the basic point here is that if I take one of these cavities, so this cavity has a single post, and you should just think of that as a cavity that holds a single mode that goes up and down like a drum head, okay? If I put three posts in this cavity, I can have a drum head mode at each of the posts, okay? And then I can write that, and they're coupled to each other. So this cavity has three modes. One where all three drum heads are oscillating in phase. And if you'd like, one where they're going around this way and one where they're going around that way, clockwise and counterclockwise. And then if you put uh, 
a Yig sphere, which is like a fairy magnet into this cavity, uh, it can couple to the magnetic field of the one that goes in the same direction as the, uh, the magnetic, uh, uh, as the precession of the, the spins in the fairy magnet. And that splits out one of the modes and just leaves this other one. And so this creates a cavity whose on-site orbital rotates by two pi in space as you go around it. Okay, and so we can see this, we get these very nice splittings um, of one of the modes and the mode of interest is this one that doesn't split. So, so why is this good? Because now you can create a lattice where every fourth site here has this, uh, so these are all just normal S orbitals and every fourth site has a PX plus IPY orbital. Okay, and it turns out that's equivalent to a quarter flux Hofstetter model. Um, and so indeed, uh, we can see uh, the band structure of this thing. We can watch dynamics. When we excite on the edge, we can watch the chiral. This is real data. Watch the excitations propagate around the edge of the system. Um, this was a room temperature version of that. We, um, we now have uh, a version at uh, like 100 milli, 100 milli Kelvin, uh, actually probably closer to, t to 30 milli Kelvin, where the thing goes around like, you know, a hundred times or something before it decays. And we've now coupled that to one transmon qubit, and we can count the number of photons in each of the edge channels using like chiral cavity QED in the modes of that system. And what we need to do next is put a transmon qubit in each site of this lattice. And that's, and that's the next step. Uh, so if you have somebody who would like to join us and, uh, and fabricate 150 transmon qubits uh, and carefully insert them into each site of this lattice, we would be happy to pay them to do that. But that's, you know, I would say that 150 transmon qubits really is kind of the state of the art for like Google and, uh, and, uh, and, and IBM for the size of system that you can realize. So we're, we're picking the low hanging fruit. We'll have a paper come out within the next month showing one qubit uh, and, and, uh, and then we're gonna figure out how to go up to hundred. Sorry, John. So, so this pi over two flux. Where does uh, it come from? Is that the question? Oh no, no, no. Okay, so I, I, I thought I, I was thinking of it as pi flux, but you're you're talking about pi over two. So that's... Yes, pi over two. Yeah. So the way to think about that, if you'd like, where's Zoom? Zoom's here. Yeah, pi pi flux is not nearly as much fun as pi over two flux. So the basic picture is this: you've got your lattice sites. And uh, this one has uh, two pi of phase when you go around it, okay? So now you ask, what happens when I go around this plaquette? How much phase do I pick up? Well, the point is the orbitals have the same phase everywhere. These, these three orbitals, one, two, three, all have the same phase. So I pick up no phase when I go here. Yeah. I pick up no phase when I go there. But what about when I go here? Well, the point is the orbital has a different phase at this point where I'm coupled to that site than this point where I'm coupled to that site. And how different are they? Well, since I told you the orbital has two pi of phase, that has pi over two, right? So when I go around the plaquette, I pick up a flux of pi over two. And, uh, and, and that's the whole thing right? You want every fourth site to be one of these things. Uh, right. And sure enough, it just works beautifully. And before you say, well, now you have a fairy magnet that participates, doesn't that spoil everything? Remember that the point is we had three modes and the one that the fairy magnet coupled to is the mode that we don't use. Yeah. So in fact, the fairy magnet doesn't spoil the queue in spite of providing the time reversal symmetry break. Yeah, so out of curiosity, you, 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 I understand you're not um, as the pi flux um, doesn't have a gap in the spectrum and so on. Mm -hmm. You can create a pi flux or? 
Yes. Um, so, so maybe you're going to tell me that Pyflux is as interesting because Pyflux is actually much easier to make okay. because Pyflux yeah, doesn't so break teeth. The Pyflux could be interesting if you could, for example, modulate the coupling between the different, so some, some kind of modulation of the hopping. In time or just in space? No, or in space. Yeah, that's not hard. I mean, because it's just changing capacitors, so. Yeah, you can create this sort of um, so-called um, higher order topological phases that way, for example. These are these, uh, what Gil likes to call hotties? Hotties, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the cool thing is, if you just want a pi flux, intuitively, the easiest way to do it, you have your lattice sites, and you couple them mostly with capacitors, like I drew before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you put one inductor, yeah. that's pi flux, and exactly. you're done. Yeah. Right. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if you have ideas for cool things to get that way, you should. We should definitely chat about them. Sure. Um, and and then you just have to modulate the values. Look, what I would say is that's very easy for me because I'm, as you can see, I'm sitting at my house anyway. But <laughs> uh, but but I think it would also be quite doable for the uh, for the students. Yeah. Yeah. And it so, doesn't require the fairy magnets, which then need magnets and so forth. Yeah, that would be really cool. I will follow up. Um, I think there was another hand raised at some point. Um, but I don't see any right now. It may have been one that failed to go down earlier. I think that that's probably what it was. Uh, OK, um, are there any other questions? Um, so, so John, actually, uh, um, Maybe I could ask. Uh, so in the mod insulator, uh, could you? Uh, is it possible to measure um, the fluctuations of each side? Uh, you know the, the in photon, time photon number in time. Or, yeah, for instance, just to see uh, if if they if they're occupied if they if they if they go below Poissonian or. So or okay, so there we should be we should be a little careful. Um, mm -hmm. One has to, to think about what you even expect in time, right? So one thing you could ask is, what percentage of the time do you get one photon in the site? And what I plotted for you was not really the mean occupation, it was the probability of getting one photon, right? And so the point is, once you're at like 85 or 90% probability of getting one photon when you measure, that is sub-Poissonian. I see. Right, because the point is Poisson is what? P sub n is e to the minus mu, mu to the n. And there is no value of mu for which P sub one is like 0.9. Okay. Right, uh, so, so you can just do that. That being said, I think your question is a really interesting one in the following sense. What the, the thing that we've been thinking about measuring is I gave you the occupation of each site, but the first question we wanted to ask is what do the correlations between the sites look like, right? Like are the, are, are the times when this one has zero, which is like what, 10% of the time here, right? Does this one have two? Right? Or are, are these quantum fluctuations, double on whole yeah. fluctuations? Or is the point that that's a photon that's been lost, right? And we're still trying to refill it, right? So one way to do that is look at these correlations in space. Mm -hmm. But I think another way to do it is, as you say, look at correlations of a single site in time. And I have to say, I haven't thought too much along that axis for the following reason. The correlations in space have a well-defined value that you expect for the equilibrium situation that's undriven, right? And so our attitude yeah, has yeah, been, yeah. we should look at the spatial correlators at fixed time and use that as an indication of whether we're seeing out of equilibrium dynamics, right? But what you're saying, which I think is equally, if not more interesting, is maybe instead you should look at a fixed point in space over time at what the correlators are, 
And that's a signal that just doesn't exist at all in the equilibrium yeah. system, right? Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Because yes. there are no time crystals. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I like that a lot. Okay, thanks, thanks. And yes, we could do it, we have not. Okay, okay. Thank you for me. All right, so maybe with that we can conclude. And uh, if you would like to discuss more, of course, uh, here <laughs> you can find John. Uh, mm -hmm. This, this was really wonderful. I love the interactivity. This has been uh, a real pleasure. Thank you.